Hi, it's me, Tim Dodd, the Everyday Astronaut. Welcome to Starbase Texas. This is where SpaceX is building, testing, and even launching their Mars-bound rocket, Starship. Today I'm going to take you inside the gates and show you things that have never been shared outside of SpaceX. Best of all, we have the ultimate tour guide, Elon Musk, who answers all of my questions and gives us unbelievable insights to the rocket's development. We talked and walked around for over two hours, so I'll be cutting this up into three parts. The first two are at the Starbase factory, and the last one is at the launch pad. Each section has a gold mine of valuable information, so make sure you're subscribed, you've got your notifications on, and you've got your notepads ready to jot some notes. Now, heads up, we talk about some pretty advanced concepts and subject matter that can be pretty intimidating on first listen, but don't worry, I've got you covered with lots of informational videos here on my channel. So perhaps if you're new to Starship, or really all of this stuff, consider watching my complete guide to Starship. That'll be a really good overview for you for some of the things that we talk about here in this conversation. And I'll also be linking to some of my other videos that will help out with some of the stuff that we talk about as well. Now you might notice we mentioned Soviet rocket engines quite a bit in this conversation. Maybe it's because I was wearing my new Soyuz shirt that you can get at everydayastronaut.com shop. Or perhaps it's because I've been working on a complete history and family tree of Soviet rocket engines for almost two years now. And that video is currently in the works and it will be out when it's done. And one last thing, this video is broken up into sections and we have links in the description for those sections. We also will occasionally be putting up a little map courtesy of Ring Watchers on Twitter that will help you keep your bearings as we're walking around. I think that'll help quite a bit. And we also have an article version of kind of our conversation and some of the key points that we bring up over at everydayastronaut.com. There is a link in the description to that as well. Okay, enough talking. Let's go hang out with Elon. So the camera, follow the camera. And then somebody else it's with just, the camera. It's just camera envy at this point. He's just trying to, he saw me with and this and he's like, listen. I'll get my camera out. Yeah, <laughs> yeah you, you so take can, a video of me. I can take a video of this, of you guys taking then a video. Then you get over, make sure this is going through there. Okay. Just okay. shoot the screen the whole time. Okay. I don't want okay. anything else. <laughs> All right, so this, this is, okay, so we, this is, I'm being videoed here and then the video of the video. And, and this then is, I'll this also is the video of the video of the video. Go back there. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. So I feel like I got here maybe at about the most exciting peak of insanity. Uh, it's definitely a, a very exciting time because we are in a um, kind of a final push to complete the the launch uh, launch system stage zero essentially, um, and uh, it's worth saying that. The, the launch system, the tower, and the you know the chopstick arms to catch the rocket are uh, as complex as either of the stages. Really? So, yeah, absolutely. Uh, if not more. Um, so, uh, like we we could produce boosters and uh, ships way easier than we could make uh, the launch site. So. Uh, so therefore, I'd say it is harder certainly than any single uh, booster or, or, or ship. Um, yeah. Well, that's, I think that's one of those things people don't even realize is the manufacturing out here. That's kind of one of those things that you harp on so much is how, you know, how that's so important. And that's, in the long scheme, the hardest part of all this is just yeah, the I, manufacturing. I think generally, manufacturing is underrated and design is overrated. So um, People generally think that like this, like this eureka moment of like you come up with this idea and 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 that's it. Now it's good. But um, that, uh, the design, like this, literally a thousand percent, maybe ten thousand percent more work that goes into the production system than the than the the, the thing itself. So say like how much effort have we put into say designing Raptor versus designing the manufacturing system? Uh, it's 10 to 100 times more effort to design the manufacturing system than the engine. Of, even of Raptor? Oh yeah, absolutely. Even, especially with Raptor. Um, so, uh, all of our, basically, call it basically, uh, the amount of effort that goes into the design rounds down to zero. <laughs> right, right. Relative to the amount to of the effort amount of that time. goes into the manufacturing system. Yeah. Uh, and if this, if this was not true, great. I'd like uh, a thousand Raptors, please. <laughs> Uh, oh, we can't make them? Oh, okay. Right, right. Uh, uh, so, um, 
This is like just very fundamentally underappreciated. If people have not been in manufacturing, especially manufacturing of something that's uh, relatively new, then they don't understand, and they, they think the design is the hard part, and not and they think production is like a copier or something like that. Right. This is completely false. Uh, well, it's definitely not as sexy as the end thing. Like you know, the end product is very sexy, and you know that's what draws people's attention. But the whole back end of it is yeah. what makes it possible. I can't emphasize enough. I'm trying to correct the misperception that design is the hard part. It is not the hard part. Uh, there have been lots of great rocket engines designed. You've spent a lot of time looking at the Russian rocket engine designs. There's some amazing uh, Russian rocket engine designs. They've been doing stage combustion for a long time. Yeah. And they've done, I don't know, hundreds of different designs, uh, literally. So, but, so, so the, the hard part is not, can you design a staged combustion rocket engine? This has been done. Yeah. Um, now, admittedly, ours is a higher pressure than before, and it is a full flow stage combustion. Um, but th these are th that's a relatively minor increment relative to what the Russians have already done. Right. Um, what is super hard about Raptor is uh, how do we make a Raptor where the cost per ton of thrust is under a thousand dollars? Yeah, I mean, we, we definitely don't want to. The fundamental thing that needs to be fixed is the, the cost per ton to orbit. Yeah. So. Things that, have, that, that address the cost per ton to orbit are good. Like, um, you know, humanity will be a multi-planet species if we get cost per ton to orbit to the point where we can afford to become a space ring civilization and a multi-planet species. Right. So this is, at, at, at its heart, it is a fundamentally um, an optimization of cost per ton to orbit and then ultimately cost per ton to the surface of Mars. Right. Well, and if you're working on getting the cost, of, even when you're starting to think of it as dollars, dollar per ton of thrust, I mean, I don't know if, it's, if anyone's ever considered that as a key metric. Yeah. You know, that's a new new thing that I, I, I've never thought about, you know, never considered. Yeah. Well, and then even Raptor is kind of unique because now you start to also think about the, uh, instead of thrust to weight ratio, when you have a fixed diameter and a fixed uh, circle area, you're also worried about the nozzle exit to thrust ratio as being a, a pretty strong consideration too. Yeah, you, you basically end up, end up filling up all the area uh, under the rocket. Um, so, with this version we have 29 engines. I'm sure there's a lot of beeping. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure having this many things beep is actually helpful. For <laughs> Uh, sensory overload. Yeah, it's like, it's like everything around you is crying wolf. If everything's in danger, you just got to tune it out. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> so it's pretty silly, but... Uh, yeah, so this is, not, this is the nose of uh, Booster 4. Or the yeah, top this, is, this, is, this is basically, that's the inter, inter stage and the, the fuel tank of Booster 4. Wow. Uh, so, yeah. What, what are the, uh, the little... So obviously those are where the grid fins go, right? Yeah. And then what's the thing in between them? Uh, that's that's basically that's actually the mount point. Um, so that's there there are two. It's, it's debatable whether this is uh, the right design or not. In fact, it's like all designs are wrong, just a matter of how wrong. Uh, but, <laughs> but that's uh, one of the load points for picking up the booster. So that thing that you see, yeah, that yeah. It's this like tiny little. It looks small. Yeah, it looks like a... But it's actually not that small at close up. It's this thing's just high in the air. Like, all your sense of perspective is, is wrong. Yeah. And when this, when this lands, uh, it has, like, basically the, de the density of, an, uh, of a beer can. Right. You know, an anti beer can. Right. What is the dry uh, mass? With, of... with, like, some mass, uh, you know, in the engines, obviously. Um, what well, is the dry mass? Are you under 200 tons for booster? We, we should be under 200 tons. Uh, Uh, the, the mass is a moving target, so um, you don't have to say like what are your prop propellant residuals when you land. Uh, that's a big deal. Um, like both how much margin will you have and uh, what's your unused your unusable propellant. Like right. you can't just go to zero margin, you know, because right. right. the thing's gonna crater. Yeah. So. Um, uh, it, sh it should be under 200 tons, though. So. But as a rough rule of thumb, like the engines, including mounting mass, are roughly two tons. So if you've got tw uh, 29 engines at 58 tons, um, then uh, the, the sort of uh, the fuel tank itself and the, the oxygen tank, it's probably on, on, on the order of uh, 
Well, it's a little heavy right now, so maybe it's like 80 tons or, or so. Um, then you, know, you got the interstage uh, with the where you've got the Griffins, yep. uh, batteries, and a bunch of other things. Yep. Uh, so that's uh, right, I don't know, maybe around 20 tons. And then uh, you've got uh, uh, propellant residuals, which might be on the order of 20 tons too. Okay. So for, for all, all that should come to, I don't know, I call it 160 to 200 tons, depending on uh, the sort of final mass numbers. But like right now, everything's hit too heavy. Like avionics too heavy. The, the, the avionics even? Yeah. I thought it was just a little. I mean, it should be, but uh, the the grid fins are electrically powered, so cool. uh, we have batteries that are energy optimized instead of power optimized. So, um, like this grid fins only lift, needs work for like two or three minutes. Right. Right. Uh, so it's it's very different from like a electric, electric car, which. You want to have several hours of driving. Um, so these really need, we need power optimized batteries, not energy optimized batteries. This is just a short term thing. Right. Uh, so the ba battery mass can probably drop by maybe a factor of 10. Right. So that's just one example. Um, should, we, should we back up a little bit? So it's a little, yeah. Yeah. Less clanging. <laughs> yeah. And everyone trying to get their cranes in um, here and do work. You got a lot of people on site right now. Yeah, I mean, just like that, that residuals number is a big, super big deal on the mass, though. Um, because uh, the booster is designed to have 3,600 tons of propellant, uh, which is uh, an almost 80% oxygen, liquid oxygen by oh mass. God. Yeah. Um, like 78%. Because you burn at what? Is it uh, 3.5 like to 3.5, 3.7. Uh, okay. Yeah. Um, Wow. So, and you want to bias it in favor of oxygen because oxygen is denser and cheaper. Right, right. So, in terms of uh, improving your payload and, uh, you know, reducing cost per ton, uh, oxygen is, is uh, well, basically plants make it for free and plankton. Yeah. So, uh, it's just, it's basically like electricity cost of separation and distillation. Right. Um, now, uh, so remind me though, is, uh, when it, is it like, as far as the ratio goes, fuel OF ratio, having the lighter molecule, what, don't you kind of want that to be spewing out faster or something? Because it's less reaction, it, it can do, you can accelerate it quicker? Or yeah, how there's a trade off between, um, well, I mean, what you tend to get limited by uh, is you don't want to go too close to stoichiometric because uh, the, the heat's too, yeah. you, you basically melt your engine. Yeah. So uh, that tends to limit you on the OF, on, on trying to go to higher OF. Right. That's the actual thing limiting you. Uh, you. You tend to hit uh, the stoichiometric melting point uh, before you uh, roll over on ISP. Okay. Okay. Uh, generally. Okay. Uh, so um, that makes sense. Yeah. That's, and remind me, are the grid fins? Are they? Do they still fold in? No. No. Is that going to be permanently that way? Um, yeah. So the the. the what I'm trying to uh, have us all just uh, implement rigorously is uh, the sort of five-step process. Uh, first, make your requirements less dumb. Your requirements are definitely dumb. Uh, it does not matter who gave them to you. It's particularly dangerous if a smart person gave you the requirements because you might not question them enough. Yeah, you might take it as like gospel, like yes. I have to do this thing. Everyone's wrong, no matter who you are, everyone's yeah. wrong some of the time. Um, so make your requirements less dumb. Uh, then uh, try very hard to delete the part or process. Um, this is actually very important. If you're not uh, occasionally adding things back in, you're not deleting enough. Right. The, the bias tends to be very strongly towards, in, uh, let's add this part or process step in case we need it. But you can, you can basically make in-case arguments for so many things. And for a rocket that is trying to achieve um, Try to be the first fully reusable rocket. There's never been a fully reusable rocket. People don't understand. Like right. this is like the holy grail of rocketry. 100%. Okay, and so you really need you, you have to run at tight margins because if you don't run tight margins, uh, you're going to get nothing to orbit. Right. Uh, so uh, so you got to delete the part of process step. Super important. Um, and you and you can't like hedge your bets. Uh, so. Uh, that's why the grid fins, for example, do not fold, fold down because that's a whole extra me mechanism that we don't need. And, and you then, can just and compensate then it, for it by having strong enough engine authority to steer it 
in the yeah. low atmosphere. Actually, our simulation, so we don't really need any extra engine authority. As long as the grid fins, you know, basically uh, follow the flow, uh, they, they're not really disturbing the flow. It's really neither here nor there. So, uh, so as long as they don't have a high, high angle of attack, right. it doesn't matter. A few degrees or something, or within yeah. a degree or two. So, but in any case, it's a thing we could add later. Right. So now these grid fins are humongous. We'll go see them, um, but they're like, I mean like a dinosaur bear trap, okay? If you have a bear trap or a dinosaur, that's what these things look like. Uh, and if you have a, have a whole mechanism for folding them, that's like clearly a part that we don't need. Yep. So this was a good design decision um, that uh, actually I didn't come up with. And it was like, great. Uh, but it followed the principle of like, lead the part, lead the process. Uh, and I was like, great, good idea. Let's not fold them. Um, why were we folding them anyway? Uh, ra somewhere random. like like. Uh, oh, and, and also, if, uh, whatever, if you, whatever requirement or constraint you have, it must come with a name, not a department. Because uh, you can't ask the department, you have to ask a person. Yeah. Uh, and that person who's putting forward the requirement or constraint must agree that they must take responsibility for that requirement. Yeah. Otherwise, you can have a requirement that basically an intern two years ago randomly came up with off the cuff, uh, and they're not even at the company anymore. Right. Uh, and, 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 but it came from the, let's say, Aero loads department. They're like, uh, actually, no one in the aero loads department actually currently agrees with that. Uh, this right. is not. This is, by the way, happened several times. So again, it can be literally. I, I don't want to put on the aero loads department, but it's like yeah. there's like it's every department. Uh, right. So, so it can be thought of as gospel again, but it might be something that's just totally in passing. Like yeah, yeah. Um, or someone played too much Kerbal and had fins at the top of the rocket, and then it just you know it did this. Um. These things are often just way just more silly than you think. Yeah. Uh, so um, anyway, so step one, uh, make a requirements list dumb. Step two, delete the part or process step. If you're not adding, if you're not deleting a part or process step at least 10% of the time, it basically, if you're not adding things back in 10% of the time, you're clearly not deleting enough. Right. Um, and and then uh, only the, the third step is simplify or optimize. The third step, okay. not the first step. Um, the reason it's the third step is because it's, it's very common, it's possibly the most common error of a smart engineer is to optimize a thing that should not exist. Right. Okay. Right. Um, and, and they say, well, how do we get, why would people do that? Well, everyone's been trained in, in uh, high school and college to, that you've got to answer the question, convergent logic. Yeah. So you can't tell the professor your question is dumb, that you'll get a bad grade. You have to answer the question. Yeah. Uh, so everyone's basically, without knowing it, they got like mental straitjacket on. Uh, that is, uh, th th they'll work on optimizing the thing that should simply not exist. Right, right. Um, I'll give you an, an, an example from way back in the, the day of Falcon 1. Uh, so in the, in the original sort of like, uh, when Tom Mueller and I were like batting around, like, okay, what should this rocket look like? Um, I, was, I think I was literally in like Tom's kitchen or something. and. Um, and we had like the spreadsheet and like, okay, we need to like a, make a minimum, so minimally viable rocket, like half a ton or whatever, it's, it's something like that. And, uh, and then the, initially the spreadsheet had, uh, we, we had uh, an NTO MMH upper stage. So a sort of hyper goal upper stage, kind of Press like a train. variant of the TRW LIMD. Yep. So, yep. Which uh, I think Tom worked on, right? Yeah. Uh, well, you just, it'll, uh, Tom, the people who trained Tom worked on it. He's not that yeah. old. Yeah, that's uh, right. <laughs> uh, it was like a baby, you know. Yeah. Uh, that, uh, <laughs> well, a very advanced baby. It, you know. uh, but 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 the but his mentors did work on LMD. So, uh, you know, lunar module stand engine. So, um, you know, basically uh, a, a pedal injector. That's uh, right. That's where the pedal injector comes yeah, in, right? Yeah. Because that's a like you can also deep throttle it and everything. So. Um, now the problem with that is, uh, how much does anti-MMH cost? Oh, uh, um, it's super expensive, okay? Yeah. It's, a, it's like a rare chemical. So, uh, even if you're like, you know, if Edison and, Nikol and, and Tesla had a baby and that baby was smarter than both of them combined and said your job is to optimize an anti-MMH upper stage, you're screwed, <laughs> okay? <laughs> so, like nitrogen tetroxide and monomethyl hydrazine are super expensive. Uh, and they're also toxic. They're super nasty, yeah. Yeah, Just I mean, the handling costs alone uh, are probably pretty yeah, appreciated. Yeah, I, I mean, I do think like safety, safety is overcorrected on the anti-MMH. It went from like, 
nobody had any protection and breathed the fumes all day to it's cyanide. Okay, yeah. and, and neither of those are true. It's not cyanide. <laughs> <laughs> you won't die. Uh, and Bill Gussmeyer told me like a story of like when he started at NASA, they actually I think passed around around like a cup of like hydrazine so that everyone knew what hydrazine smelled, smelled like. like. So no. like because it's, it's like a, like a rotten egg smell or something like that. So. Um, it, it literally an open cup of hydrazine, and like obviously he's still alive. So, um, <laughs> that's so, so that's an example of like don't uh, it, you know don't optimize the thing that shouldn't exist. We should not have into MMH upper stage. Right. Um, now a dragon does have that, but that's because dragons got to do a lot a lot of like nuanced uh, firings of the Draco engines, uh, you know, with very short pulse durations, yeah. and if you have a you know, trying to have something that's not hypergolic is very difficult, uh, and I, it can be done. Like, uh, but if you say it not, not not hypergolic and not cryogenic, now your options tend to suck. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, then you start going down the peroxide, barking up the peroxide tree or something like that, and that's uh, or, or or super esoteric monoprops. Right. And, right. and it's, that's that's like again back to big money. So. Yeah. Um, that's step you know, like, three. Uh, yeah, yeah, so, exactly. So <laughs> getting through these is quite laborious. Uh, sorry for the laborious explanation here, but... Um, and then finally you get to step four, which is accelerate cycle time. You, you're moving too slowly, go faster. But don't go faster until you have worked on the other three things first. Gotcha. Um, like if you're digging, if you're digging in, you know, your grave, don't dig it faster. Stop <laughs> digging your grave. Right, right, you know? right. Uh, so, uh, but it's, you can always make things go faster. Um, and then the final step is automate. Um, and uh, now I have personally uh, made the mistake of going backwards on all five steps, multiple times. So I re oh, have to repeat three. this, yes, multiple times on model three, um, where literally I automated, accelerated, simplified, and then deleted. Uh, like one one example I've talked about before is like the there were these like fiberglass mats on top of the Model Three battery pack that were in, in between the full pan and the, the battery, um, and it was one point choking the battery pack production line. And I was like basically living on the battery pack production line, like trying to fix the line because um, it was like it was it was like choking the entire pr the Model Three production program. So. Um, so the, the first mistake was uh, we should not have, I, 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 I like try to fix the automation, like make the robot better, uh, make, it, make it like the robot move faster, a shorter path, uh, increase the torque, uh, delete the reverse 720 degrees on the, the, the bolt, because uh, that's unnecessary, just go forward, go forward fast, not at 20% rate, at 100% rate. Um, and uh, instead of spackling glue on the entire battery pack, just put little dabs of glue because the, the fiberglass mats are sandwiched between the, the battery pack and the floor pan anyway. So all you need is like something to hold it in place until you bolt the, the battery pack into the car. Gotcha. Um, so anyway, so automating was a mistake. Then accelerating was a mistake. Then optimizing was a mistake. And finally I said, what the hell are these mats for? Um, and, uh, and I asked the, the battery safety team, um, because I like, are these mats for, what, what are these mats for? They said, oh, these mats, I said, are they for fire protection or something? They said, no, they're for noise and vibration. So you don't get, the, and I said, but you're the battery department. Then I asked an uh, NBA short, a noise vibration harshness uh, team, what's it for? They said, fire safety. So literally, it was like being in a Dilbert oh, right. cartoon, okay? It was right. like, actually, I feel like I'm in a Dilbert cartoon quite frequently. So I'm like, you know, like, is it really some simulation? Where I like I'm like trapped in some like Kafka-esque slash Goldberg cartoon situation, but that's what it feels like a lot. <laughs> um, so then finally, okay, great. Um, let's let's uh, try a car with the, the fiberglass mats and without, uh, and they uh, put a microphone to both, and and see if you can tell the difference. You cannot. Uh, you cannot tell. In fact, I was like, which one is which? Um, so we just deleted them and just bypassed this $2 million robot, robot cell. It was just a complete <laughs> pile of nonsense. Um, another mistake that tends to happen in production is too much in-process testing. Uh, so 
in the, it, when you're first setting up a production line, you don't know where the like where things are are breaking. You don't know where things are breaking, so you'll test uh, like work in process at various steps, um, and because you want to isolate where's where are we where, where's the mistake occurring. Um, so a very common mistake uh, issue with production lines is to have um, is, is to not remove the in process testing. Uh, after you've uh, diagnosed where the problems are. So basically, if you have like um, a very high acceptance, if, like, if, if things are getting to end of line testing and, and are passing, uh, then you don't need to do in-process testing. So, uh, but what tends to happen is there'll be an, like an initial like development engineering team that will be like basically debugging the production line, but then they will forget to take out the in-process testing steps. Uh, so then, what happens is the in-process test tester uh, will often choke the cycle time, it'll choke, choke the line production time. Uh, it'll be like the, the limiter. Uh, it'll also have some number of false positives and false negatives. Right. Uh, but I mean, it'll be like false positives, like then you're like re rejecting good parts. Right. Um, so um, really, in volume production, if you have uh, if things are working well, uh, you're really just taking a risk. Will this part be re will this Subsystem be rejected at uh, during in the during the production process or at the end, um, and so you just really want to move things pretty much almost always to just test at the end line. That's it. Um, maybe there's like one or two in process steps that are hard to test at end of line, but that, but basically remove almost everything. Um, I mean, there was another thing with battery pack where <laughs> this is so crazy. Um, uh, we, 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 like one of the things the battery pack has to do is, is resist uh, water ingress, so it has to be leak proof. Uh, so if you drive through deep water, uh, water doesn't come into the battery pack and short out the battery pack. You might have seen some of the videos of like people driving Teslas in like extremely yeah. flooded waters, just like where it's this like, week, China. like half underwater. Ones? Yeah, people like geez. there was literally a guy, I, I believe in Kazakhstan, literally drove a Model S through a submerged water tunnel, yeah. like like it was, and all the other cars were were, were out. And he basically steered the car with the wheels yeah, and used the wheel floating. rotation yeah. to like a boat yeah. and, and drove out the tunnel. Um, so you, this is important to have the battery pack resist water ingress. But then instead of us doing a, uh, a pressure test on the battery pack, we, we, were, we were actually pressurizing the inside of the battery pack, uh, which was the opposite, uh, wrong direction. Um, and the battery pack lid was glued, but you know, was, was basically had resin that was uh, not not cured and so we were just blurting out the resin which doesn't make any damn sense because right, right. you should actually be drawing a vacuum on the on the on the pack uh, and not not trying to not not pressurizing it right um, and especially not pressurizing it when there's uh, uncured resin is what's holding down the battery pack yep so that so the, the pack was failing quite often on the pressurization test, which should have been a vacuum test. <laughs> um, anyway. Oh, uh, speaking so. of Gridfin. Yeah, great. Look at that. Man, that thing is huge. Yeah, that's why I said it's like a... Like a dinosaur, dinosaur bear trap. Dinosaur bear trap. <laughs> oh wait, that'd be a di just a dinosaur trap, wouldn't it? <laughs> yes, it's a dinosaur trap. <laughs> that's insane. Yeah. Honestly, I mean, that's... this thing could catch a T-Rex. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh, that's crazy! And of course, it's got the serrated teeth, which help it help in the transonic regimes, right? Yeah. Is there any other reason for the teeth other than than that? No, it's just um, well, it actually helps in uh, transonic and subsonic, but. Um, yeah, it's it's the, your the effectiveness is better if you've got a pointy, if it's more pointy, basically. Um, there is a limit to its pointiness. <laughs> Sorry, hey Marvin. So, yeah, exactly. It's crushed under a bear. Under a... Wow. So how heavy are these guys? Uh, man, these are. Uh, I shudder to think. Actually, I don't know the number offhand, but. Probably on at least uh, three tons, I'm okay. guessing. So eyeballing it. And but this sure is not. This is why, like, when I say it's like a moving target, this is not the. Uh, like, I wouldn't take this to the bank. Like, it's right. not. Um, you know. 
We'll, there's a, quite a lot of mass we can get out of this. Right, right. Um, is, yours is just good enough for now. Like that's. Yeah, it's good enough for now. Um, but like, you know, the, we, we basically just need, need like an, enough control authority to uh, get this through the atmosphere and positioned well enough so that when the engine's light, the engine can correct whatever error is left after the, you know, the, uh, that, that we, we couldn't take out with the grid fins. Right, right. Um, so. Um, Man, that the, is crazy. Those are huge. Yeah. And so it looks like the, the motor will mount to the, that lever arm there, is that just a? Yeah. So this is, um, yeah, uh, th there's a motor that's, th this will basically be, re this will react onto the, the dome, basically the fuel dome. Um, so there's like kind of like a C-channel around the, the, fuel, the, the fuel dome at the top. Yep. Uh, and there's a motor that's going to rotate this with a gearbox. Um, and uh, that, that's basically the load will be reacted between the circular feature that you see there uh, and yep. the, the sort of, I should say C-channel, uh, sort of uh, L-channel uh, on the dome. So it's okay. just a simple sort of ring on the dome. Okay. Uh, and then is that, so what I'm seeing there where there's the, the ropes actually I threw it on the end here, is that the lever arm for the thing or is that just a... Yeah. Wow. So oh, the, I see, it slides over, it's like a... Yeah. Okay. That's, that's basically the, that's where the, the motor will interact. So it's, okay. it's uh, yeah. Wow. Yeah, but it's just basically, uh, we're just using like Model 3 motors basically. Yeah, uh, which is so cool. Yeah, so, yeah, might as well use them. So, uh, you, you mentioned you're, you know, really trying to simplify it. Is, there's been talks that they're not, after, did you say it on Twitter that you weren't going to have cold, you're going to eliminate thrust, the cold gas thrusters or hot gas thrusters on the, on the V4 for the first orbital test? Yeah, uh, but we can, we can move to like maybe a more, uh, a quieter location. Yeah. Um, I mean, I'm pretty sure we can cut the weight of that in half. Um, like that's, you know, we're not even really trying to optimize the gauge. That's just basically uh, plate. You yeah. Know, that's just like cut, cut plate right. uh, welded together. So uh, we first just got to like make the damn thing work and then we'll optimize it. Yeah, of course. Um, Which again, is something the Soviet Union was so good. That was like minimum viable product basically to get it get it good enough to fly and test. And obviously you guys did that with Starship big time with the with 8, 9, 10, 11, 15 yeah. was like, let's just get it out there, see what works, see what doesn't, and iterate, you know? Yeah, and, and if you look at like the, the various reasons like well, where we blew up uh, Starships, like, um, and you looked at the risk list, uh, n n none of the th reasons it blew up were on the risk list. Really? Yeah, it was like no, maybe you could argue like one of them maybe was on somebody's risk list, but it wasn't brought up beforehand. Right. Over that way. Right, right. Um, so, uh, I, I mean, there's a crazy amount of new technology happening here and it's all evolving simultaneously. So, um, we, we need to iron out like the unknown, unknowns, so to speak. Um, yeah. Yeah, the unknown unknowns are the big ones. And there's, we got the new, is that the new flaps for 20 down there? Yeah. So, uh, remind me, the, the numbering scheme, because you, you were talking about version two Raptor the other day. What we've seen so far, and are those version two yet? Or not, like the green, the green nozzles, are those, those aren't version two yet, right? Have you started, have you started making version two? Uh, we've made parts of version two. Okay. Um, so. We're gonna make the uh, thrust chamber. We've made the thrust chamber assembly, um, and uh, we, we uh, have, I think, pretty much finished the design of the pumps. Uh, we're gonna make the pumps. Um, so uh, hopefully, we'll, we'll have I don't know Raptor two. Uh, you know, in, in about a month, we might be testing the first one. Okay. So. And, and will that be, you, you said you're still going to be kind of producing stuff, or the prototypes are kind of going to be always in Hawthorne, then eventually you're going to be moving mass production to McGregor. Uh, yeah, um, we're, we're doing volume production of, um, of, of Raptor and McGregor, but we'll keep uh, California factory uh, operating. Um, 
basically for uh, development, development engines and um, the Raptor vacuum motion. Yeah, wrap back. So yeah, yeah. Um, so you're, if you're reaching 230, 230 ton on version two, what what bar are you going to be? What's that going to be at? Like three hundred. Three hundred is uh, awesome. technically I think two ninety eight, but uh, but we, I think we should. Come on, we gotta like get two more bar out of that thing. Yeah. So. Wait, wait, wait. So even at only only 300, big air quotes on 300. You're so you're getting 230 already. Yeah, but the, we're opening the throat um, uh, and reducing the area ratio. Okay. So the extra thrust is it like there's a slight. I think we lose like two or three seconds of ISP, but we gain a lot more in thrust. Yeah. Um, and it, uh, the increase in thrust outweighs the slight drop in ISP. Yeah, especially on the first stage. Yeah. Yeah. But what's the... Uh, I mean, basically any thrust weight below one is worthless. It's worthless, yeah. yeah. So, so if you go from 0.4 to 0.5, it's a massive leap compared massive. to even... Yeah, yeah. Okay, so that makes, that makes total sense. So the, uh, the wrap vac, what's that... Ex what's currently... What's that for thrust? Is it still around that same number, about 200 tons, but... No, the, uh, uh, the Raptor vacuum R vac, mm -hmm. we call it, um, it will actually be... The, the 230 ton thrust number is the thrust at sea level uh, of the, uh, the the sea level version of, of version two of, of the. Uh, it's essentially it's like helpful to you, and like some people like quibble about like why are you talking about thrust in tons? That's not technically a scientific thing. Uh, it's because you can do the math in your head really easily if you have a rocket in tons and thrust in tons. Right, of course. That's of course. why. And, and Newtons, you got to like divide yeah, by 10 all the time. Right. This is like annoying. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then you only get kilograms. Now you got to like divide by 10,000 <laughs> to get tons. Right, this is right. ridiculous. Yeah, it is. Okay, it so is. you're like, what? this is absurd. Yeah. Only a fool would use Newtons, in my okay. opinion, uh, if they're designing a rocket. Um, so, uh, and, and like, especially big rockets, because you, you just like have a zillion newtons. So yeah. Um, so, but if you measure things in tons and you measure thrust in tons, now you know thrust to weight very easily. Right. Um, so is, now, is this, so is that like the only imperial thing you measure then? No, these are uh, still old, metric tons. Metric tons. Okay. Okay. Yeah. That makes sense. Okay. I was getting uh, nervous like, for a second. For I was pressures like, in bar. Yep. Uh, and and because uh, everybody kind of knows like what's one atmosphere. Yeah. So yep. uh, Pascal's is another trash unit. I hate Pascal's. <laughs> uh, so why is it so tiny? It's absurd. Right, right. Um, we should have a whole a whole segment of units that Elon hates, and it's just <laughs> not, it's like units that make uh, understanding things more harder instead yeah. of easier. Yeah. Um, but everyone understands like bar or an atmosphere essentially. Yes. Uh, and everyone understands, like people can get their mind around a ton. Like you have right. an intuitive sense for a ton. Yeah. Okay. Like a, your car is like car. two tons. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Like, can't pick some that grass. Up. You have some some yeah. context. Yeah. For if it. you got hit by a ton, you'd know what that meant. <laughs> if you got hit by a Pascal, it's like I don't know, a mouse part. <laughs> it's like one Pascal. Um, right. So. Wow. So the. Because there's another important principle, which is that um, you really want uh, everyone to be chief engineer. So that everyone is chief engineer means that people need to understand the the system at a high level, to know uh, what they uh, when they are making a, a, a bad optimization. Uh, it's like like when they are uh, like uh, say like this. We've done this many times. Where we've like put immense effort into reducing the uh, engine mass, but not, uh, but hardly any effort into reducing uh, propellant residuals, or, or like order of magnitude less effort into uh, reducing propellant residuals. And then you, end, you, you land with a literal ton of unused fuel. Uh, and, and actually, we still kind of do that with Falcon 9. It has about a ton of unused fuel for, upon landing, wow. which is pretty annoying. Right, um, oh, that's still, not much in the grand scheme of, of everything. It's still not much, but that is in context. Though, it still is quite a bit, though. Yeah, but like we spend so much effort getting a ton out of engines. Like you know, that's sort of whatever, like 130 kilograms per engine. Like that's right. 100. Yeah. So 120. -ish. So. Uh, yeah. Wow. Look, the sunsets out here are pretty hard to beat. That's insane. God, that's amazing. So uh, congrats on the uh, HLS 
solidifying oh, yeah. a little more today. That yeah, was cool. Uh, the Geo is uh, a staunch defender of, of uh, good contracting. <laughs> um, Can we head over and check out the yeah. uh, the mock up there? Because there's still a lot that we don't know about HLS publicly, at least. I assume that you know uh, <laughs> a decent amount more. I don't know if I do, uh, but. Well, first off, I guess the most obvious one that I'm excited about is those thrusters. Oh yes, at the top. okay, so, uh, yeah, so the thrusters are a good example of running that algorithm I just mentioned, mm -hmm. uh, laboriously mentioned, uh, which, which is uh, a question of the requirements, the regular requirements that's dumb, delete the part. Yep. So, yep. Um, When looking, when, when looking at what, what does the booster actually need to do um, uh, with stage separation, um, if you put rotation into the stack before, sta like before you turn off the main engines, yep. uh, so they're both, they're both rotating, they're going to rotate. Uh, and Which way, sorry, like pitching and yawning? Yeah, or, so like you've you got the integrated stack. Yep. We, we do this with, uh, with Starlink. With Starlink. Yes. So we rotate the stage. Okay. Uh, and it kind of flings it out. Yes, but the like the they they, they basically uh, have uh, different amounts of, of inertia. Uh, it's initially rotational, moving to linear inertia. So the, the, they they basically move at different rates. So if, if you if you rotate the thing, yep. depending on where you are, uh, you will move at a different speed. Yep. And so it automatically separates if you if you rotate okay. uh, and then separate. So there's no actual separation mechanism for the Starlink satellites. And yep. they technically can bump into each other and occasionally do. But if you, they bump into each other at like one mile an hour, it doesn't matter. Right, right. So they just bounce off and each other. And they already made it through the pretty harsh fine. environments of launch. Yeah, it's, it's fine. So, um, but like, I'm pretty sure this is like, this might be the only uh, like we were like literally tossing 60 satellites off with no, with like like a hay, bundle of hay, like you know, <laughs> yeah, d dumping the, the the you know rods that hold them down, yeah, like like a hay bale and just yep. flinging them, just flinging, and it's fine. They, yeah. they just separate, um, boot up and go to their position. So, and that's anyway, so so uh, if you go to stage step uh, and instead of it, uh, instead of asking the uh, the attitude control thrusters, the reaction control thrusters to uh, do the booster rotation, which is a lot of force. Uh, you have the main engines uh, initiate rotation. Yep. Um, now this is a quite complex uh, space ballet because uh, everything's got to happen in just the right way. Um, but you basically uh, initiate the initiate the rotation of the stack, cut off, stop the main engines. Um, then the, the two will actually separate. Uh, by themselves, yeah. um, and uh, you, you, uh, you, need, you need like a little bit of. You, we, we have like call gas, um, rea uh, ACS or reaction control system. It's like depending on who you ask, it's a reaction control system right. or an attitude control system. Right. It's just, it's basically like uh, small maneuvering thrusters. Yep. Um, so you fire those on the on the ship. That gives you a little bit of um, maneuvering. And then on the booster, we actually have uh, quite a lot of ullage gas. Like basically, the um, you've got a, a lot of hot gaseous oxygen and hot uh, methane, which actually have you know if you've got a big enough area, it's got decent uh, thrust and vacuum. The actual, the actual the vents. The, yeah, just the thing literally you, you used to vent vent the stage. Yeah, so not in a separate so hot we, gas bottle, but literally like the ullage of the the main tanks. Yes. Okay. Uh, so just use the ullage uh, as your uh, as your thrusters, um, and just just control the orientation of the venting, so it is not just venting out sideways, but it is venting in a direction that is useful. Work. So, which can be sideways sometimes. Um, anyway, we've got like basically a lot of gas in this thing, yeah. um, and. Uh, which we would have to actually just vent to vacuum anyway, because right. it's, it's got too much gas, yep. and that's just extra mass that you don't need. Right. So, um, so if you've got basically enough control authority because of the uh, kick, kicking the whole stack over before main engine cutoff, um, plus uh, using the ullage gas to vent, then you don't need 
uh, you don't need a separate hot gas thruster system. You don't even need a cold gas thruster system. You already have hot gas. For, for the this booster, right? Delete only... the question requirements, delete the part. Yes, yeah. yes. But this is only for the booster, right? Yes. Um, although arguably, now you mentioned it, we, should, we, should, we, might, we might, might be wise to do this for the ship too. How can you have, you'd think that, because at what, least the, mostly. Because well, the, the tanks are what, six or eight bar or something? The main tanks? Uh, yeah, they'll be like six, six-ish bar. Okay, and uh, so wouldn't those be pretty low pressure, you know, low ISP gas thrusters if you're only doing the gas from there? Or is there some trick you can do to? No, in, in vacuum, um, you don't, like, it's just different in atmosphere. So, um, like six bar in, in vacuum is, uh, is actually decent. Like, it's, um, it's like, Common to have um, thrusters, in-space thrusters that are, uh, let's say, eight bar, like like the the the, the, the Draco thrusters for th that maneuver Dragon are operating around chamber pressure of around eight or nine bar. What? Yeah, really. You don't need a, 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 like Dragon is still in psi, so it's like 120 to 130 psi. Technically, it's a pressure pulse, but right. Uh, it's took you know so. Uh, 120 psi is like roughly eight bar ish, maybe eight and a half bar. So, so, so it's not that far from the tank tank pressure. Right. So, so you, you don't even need to store the gas in an even higher, like in a bottle that's at like 200 bar or something. You don't even need to do that to, to operate RCS. Uh, no. Uh, if you've got hot gas, um, first of all, it's like it's it's. We really want the olive gas to be as, as hot as possible, uh, up to the point where it is uh, impacting the. Uh, the strength of the of the hull. Like we don't want to soften the metal so much that it pops, basically. Right. Um, so um, the hotter the gas is, the, the higher the ISP. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> so uh, having hot gas is good, uh, and it's and it's already there, and it's you already have the pressure vessel, right. and you're going to chuck it away anyway. Yeah. So obviously, you just use it as uh, attitude for attitude to control. So, so, like obviously, uh, now, now initially you can't do this with the ship because everything's cryo. Um, but once the ship is mostly empty uh, and it's delivered to orbit, it also is in the same situation with a lot of hot gas. Yeah. So actually, we should really be uh, the vast majority of our maneuvering should be with the hot gas that's in the in the ship. I thanks. Now that oh, we're gonna fix that. Jeez. That's, but I, yeah, okay, so the thrusters on HLS that are gonna be around the ring, it, the renders showed like 24 or something of, of like, you know, the landing. Oh, no, no, those are different. Those are, those those are for landing on the moon. Okay, yeah, yeah. Are those, are those pressure fed? Like, what are those? Do you have a name for them yet or anything? Um, let's just say like, uh, like this is, this is the tentative design right now, but, uh, I, with the agreement of, of NASA, we I think we may see that design evolve, okay. uh, and it may be better actually. Than, right. So, uh, um, like a, 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 like a, a big question here is like, uh, can you land can you land on the moon with the main engines, or do you need a, a separate thruster system that's way up there? Like basically, if you if you land with the main engine, are you going to dig a big ditch uh, right. in the moon and right. then fall over because you landed in a ditch that yeah. you dug? And you shot it's like literally dig your own it. grave. Yeah, <laughs> that would be uh, obviously bad. Right. You know, right. so uh, we don't want to dig our <laughs> dig our own dig our own grave and then fall in it. Right, right. Um, but uh, more analysis is like I think we could probably land with the main engine and not dig a dig a grave and die in it, but we would have to prove that. Uh, you know, get something that's like, I don't know, uh, the consistency of uh, like lunar regolith and, and like something that's like a good, uh, good analog. analog of that and, and then like land, uh, land a ship in that and see how big a hole, big, how big is a hole that we yeah, dig. Yeah, yeah. Um, if you've got low pressure engines that are high up, naturally you're gonna have a much, you're not gonna dig a hole basically. Right, right, right. Um, so that's kind of like the sure thing. Um, 
But I think if we can prove that the main engines uh, do not dig a, a giant hole, then we, then we could land with the main engines, and, and then not have the and not have any of those. Yeah. The ring. Yeah. Are, are, what about the? Um, uh, are you going to have any sea level Raptors on the lunar variant, or will you only have uh, vacuum optimized? Because I assume, like on a normal Starship, even at stage separation, you'll probably light all six at first, just to minimize gravity loss or something, right? So you'll still fire all six and then probably shut down the sea levels and let the vacuum optimize, you know, like they probably do what, like half the half the second stage burn time or something with sea level or if you... Uh, well, so the the vacuum engines don't, don't gimbal. Yep. So you'd have to have something to provide the control authority. I mean, technically you could say like, well, if, you, if you're in a, a low disturbance situation, like the moon has no atmosphere. Right. Man, this is beeping city. <laughs> Want to uh, move on? Yeah. So, uh, if you're not, if, if you're, if you're not uh, facing like a lot of atmospheric disturbances, then you're, you you need much less control authority, and you could possibly uh, probably land with three just by differential throttling of three engines. Yeah. Uh, but if you did, if you lost any of the engines, you'd be toast. Yep. Yep. So, probably makes sense. To, uh, I don't know, probably keep the same config, you know? Or, um, or like, you could even just have one in the middle that would offer, you know, a decent amount of gimbal authority and all that. It's, it depends on how much optimization is we're aiming for here. Right, because um, you're only probably gonna make one of these things, right? Or are you planning on like, is NASA wanting multiple or, oh my word. So uh, by the way, I think there's a good chance that uh, ITAR and comms might not want uh, all yeah, this. Uh. Wait until you see part two. <laughs> it is unbelievable. And I promise I'm going to get it to you as soon as I can. Thank you, Elon, for spending so much time with me and allowing me to ask all of the questions I had. It was amazing. And thanks to the teams at SpaceX for allowing me to share this all with you. And thanks to Cosmic Perspective for helping shoot this and just kind of helping out all the time. Find them on YouTube and on Patreon as well. And I owe a huge thank you to my Patreon supporters for helping make this and everything else we do here at Everyday Astronaut possible. If you want access to our Discord channel where we'll probably end up talking about this conversation a lot or live streams or lots of other fun stuff, head on over to patreon.com slash everydayastronaut. And while you're online, be sure and check out our awesome web store. We can find shirts like this, the R7 slash Semi-Orca slash the predecessor to Soyuz new shirt that we have that is awesome, as well as our new Mars hats. But you can also find some classics like the Full Flow Stage Combustion Cycle shirt and hoodie and the Future Martian shirt and schematics collection and lots of other fun stuff. So head on over to everydayastronaut.com shop. Thanks everybody, that's gonna do it for me. I'm Tim Dodd, the Everyday Astronaut, bringing space down to Earth for everyday people.